very much. This is uh, Abraham. I saw an earlier hand. Okay, I see a good Christian too. So let's take Abraham first. Abraham, please set up. We are doing informal fallacies in the 10, the very last topic in the course. So the next three sessions will be just revision. Go ahead. Informal fallacies. Fallacies that complete language. Fallacies of true relevance. That is changing the subject, manipulating data. Very good. So you are going to study something that is titled informal fallacies. We call them informal fallacies because they are not they are not fallacies. The word fallacy you've met already, error. It means error, mistake in the way you are reasoning. Okay, from topic one to if you go and play lecture one, just for revision. Of course, you will not be examined on lecture one. But if you want to remember some of the things we said earlier, you see fallacy just means error, mistake, so on, in the way you are reasoning. So informal fallacies, why informal? We met formal fallacies in unit six, when we did, when we did fallacies that change the subject, and we did fallacies that manipulate, oh, when we did, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I got a little distracted. When we did uh, affirming, the consequent, denying the antecedent, etc. those fallacies. We said that they are formal fallacies. There is a form of deduction that you must obey, that the reasoning in question is not obeying. Okay, so instead of affirming the antecedent, that reasoning is denying the consequent. Okay. Instead of affirming the antecedent, it is rather affirming the consequent. And instead of denying the consequence, it is rather denying the antecedent, stuff like that. So those ones, we call them formal fallacies. And why formal? Because there is a rule of form that must be obeyed that the reasoning pattern then was not obeyed. This, this ones we are going to discuss, we call it informal fallacies. It means there isn't any form I want you to see why we call it so. There isn't any form that you are disobeying. Okay, so it is informal. That's one. Two, it occurs in our everyday use of what? Language. It occurs in the way we interact informally. So we make the, we commit these errors in, in our everyday informal discourse. That's why they are labeled as informal classes. So the error is either as a result of a manipulation of data a manipulation of language data means evidence premises eh? so it's either as a result of manipulation of data or manipulation of evidence or you could call it an error that arises as a result of a manipulation of language as the second one look at it so manipulating language changing the subject or manipulating data those three are the fallacies that we are going to study. And then we are telling you that the changing of the subject fallacy and the manipulation of data fallacy, those two can still be labeled as, as fallacies of irrelevance. Okay, so if you got that, then we are ready to look at the specific fallacies themselves. So please go ahead. Please go ahead, sir. Okay, please, madam, the screen is not. Oh, I've changed it all. Can someone see my screen now, please? Yes, yeah. yes, we can see. What I projected, yes, what I projected yes okay. madam. So, yes. the lady who said yes, madam, please read for me. I, I like your background too, so that I'll so wait and see if you can see it. Fallacies that manipulate language. Okay, thank you. Equivocation. Using different meanings of one word in the same context as though they mean the same, without notice to your audience. And I'm pleased to read the example. Yes, please do. Example, I don't see why women are always complaining that they do not enjoy the same freedom as men do. It is a free country, so what's the problem? Everybody in Ghana here is free to do what they like. Very good. Now, we saw equivocation already, so I, I wouldn't want to over elaborate for, for, for us at all, especially this one. The person 
is using the different connotations of the word freedom without signaling, without letting us know, or he's pretending as if all the time that he used the word freedom, it referred to the same thing. Ghana is a free country, yes, in a certain sense of the word free. But it doesn't mean that Ghana is a free place where everybody can do what they like. We don't all have the right to do what we like in Ghana. So if you use freedom in that sense of it, then you would say Ghana is not free. Can you get up this morning and go and do your jogging at the Flagstaff House? Eh? The forecourt of the... Then that's where you want to go and do jogging, sisters. <laughs> Ghana, because Ghana is a free country. Well, what that? that sense of freedom doesn't apply there. You're a prisoner in Ghana, God forbid. You say this morning, uh, I think that I want chicken and uh, this prisoner. Not the one that you yourself have asked someone to bring from home to you. You are telling the cook there that, please, give, give me, today I want to eat uh, chicken potatoes with pineapple upside down. <laughs> you know, sometimes the kids <laughs> say they give us nice, nice dishes. Prisoner. Because the second sense, I mean, the third sense of the word free that the person is using here suggests that everybody in Ghana here is free to do what they like. Says who? In that sense of it, Ghana is not a free country. So all I'm showing you is that the person is just confusing different understandings of the word free, freedom, free. Oh, that's the problem. Men and women may be free in a certain sense of the word free, but they are not equally free in another sense of the word free. Two people get busy at night. Married couples at that, eh? Two people. But only one carries the burden. At least the physical bed for nine months. Maybe someone else carries the psychological bed. It's only one person that gets the stretch marks if she doesn't manage her body well. The other person can still walk around telling people he's a veggie. You can't. We saw your picture. You saw your tummy when it was protruding <laughs> and stuff like that. That is why there is a sense in which women may not be free as men are, or men may not be free as women are. You shouldn't argue over that. Even the natural body tells you that. What's your problem? You don't want to admit it. They look at how the person is arguing. Equivocals are women. And they say, hey, what's the problem? Everybody in Ghana here is free to do what they born our born ocean. Otherwise, you would have seen that you are not getting the sense of freedom that someone may be appealing to to tell you that they are not equally the same. They are not equally free. When it comes to certain aspects, you see that. So the woman goes to that time of the man. The man doesn't. And that thing can have implications on how she's even writing the exam that day. When you've all studied, she's even a better account student or math student than this other brother. But that day, nature decides that that is the time that Auntie Red will come and visit. You know Auntie Red? And then now everything, she can't even think well. She's just disorganized. And it will last for a day or two. The third day, she's okay. You think she's as free to do things as the brother is all the time? No, even nature says no. So I just use that to show you that when, when you say, I don't see why women are always complain that they do not enjoy the same freedom as men do. This is the first connotation of the word freedom that you say, whatever you mean. It is a free country. That's another connotation of the word free. So what's the problem? Everybody in Ghana here is free to do what they like. Oh, another third connotation. This is an equivocation. It's technical. People have to point out to you for you to see that you just played on the use of the word free. It's a manipulation of the word free. The same thing is happening in the example on, on the word word law, which I showed in the test book. There's an example in your test which you refer, refer to it. Law, when the, the discussion is on homosexuality, an argument from person one and person two at the law court. One is saying they are breaking the law. God doesn't like that. Our society is, this thing is a reprehensible act in our society and so on and so forth. The other person said, well, he's, he's, he's doing what is, is acceptable. He's not breaking any statutory law. Is this what they are confusing? The two people are just confusing different connotations of the word law, divine law, God's law. What if the person doesn't believe in God? then it means you should go ahead because you, what you're appealing to doesn't apply to him. If it is a statutory law, does the state law state it explicitly or not? 
Otherwise, we'll just be confusing different connotations of that word no? and be equivocating left, right, center. Remember the Zainab is madly in love with Abu example that yeah? the person says Zainab is madly in love with Abu and mad people must be institutionalized. Therefore, the person called, therefore Zainab must be institutionalized. You see the equivocation there? This one is explicit, it's not too technical. If someone is mad, we have to put them in an enclosed you know, place and institutionalize and take care of them. Otherwise they might harm, harm themselves and others. The woman that had, apparently we are, we are told, mad woman at sex or that, has stolen someone or so to death, the brother. I mean, that is the problem. The reason why it makes sense to institutionalize someone who is mentally sick. Mad here means sick psychologically, mentally, is not in charge of her what faculties. So she can hurt herself or even someone and sometimes give them the laggard and, and fix them into that clothing that restricts them a bit. So it's okay if you say mad people should be institutionalized. That's your first premise. But the second premise says, and Zaina, a lady, hmm, is madly in love with Abu. So you started, mad people must be institutionalized. Zainab is madly in love with Abu. Therefore, we should conclude, you are concluding that, therefore, we should institutionalize Zainab. That's a confusion of two connotations of the word what, mad. And you are mixing them together to draw a conclusion as if they mean, to, they mean the same. That's what makes it equivocal. Okay. Then there was the other example that said children, noisy children are a real headache. I took it from a colleague. Noisy children are a real headache uh, to aspirins or paracetamols. It uh, will make a headache go away. Therefore, two paracetamols will make what? Noisy children go away. That is equivocation. And I think it's explicit. You can see why. Noisy children are a real headache. This use of headache now means just what? They worry. They disturb. When children are noisy, they disturb you. That is the sense in which you are using headache. Noisy children are a real headache. Two aspirins will make a headache go away. If you took in two aspirins, it will make a headache, pain in the head, physiological issue. Para. Bema utri payenako. And from we did the Omuma Tipai, that sense of Tipai or headache is not the same as the one that we took in to a paracetamol. It made it go away. They are not the same. But here is a person concluding that, therefore, if I took in two paracetamols, it will make a headache go up. Uh, excuse me, it will make, make noisy children go up. That's a conflation and oscillating. You're moving from one of the meanings to the other of what the word headache. And that's what makes it a quick vocation. Even we are reasoning and you do that. Because a little technical, I took some time to remind you of that discussion in unit three. The second one, which is not too difficult, still a manipulation of language. Remember, fallacy that is manipulating language, it's secular, which you know that already. Also called tautology, also called begging the question. Latin expression, I said it in the video I sent you, which you must look at. Petitio principi. What is it? When we saw it in definitions, it just meant you have a definendum, an unknown word, you need to, okay? They are trying to help us know the meaning of that word. But how do you do it? You use that very word to define itself. Development is to develop the nation and embark on developmental projects so that the nation becomes developed like the developed nations. I took this from a, a politician when he was speaking. Yes. And to Puntujuman, the old Puntujuman, see the two man in Pong say, A man who could be moved a cross one, almost two to two pong, two two man in Pong. Let us say, I'm a baby school, my brother. <laughs> People were clapping. They wanted to vie for that. I was sitting there saying, Bratin and I am. You don't know development. How will you find it for me? You just repeated it. If you ask me, Doc, what is critical thinking? I say, Oh, what you think critically about your thoughts? Then you are doing critical thinking. What did I see? Nothing. Pack your bag and go home. It's a waste of your time. So we saw that when we're doing definitions, 
when we're trying to give meanings. Okay, now we see it again. And the whole topic, what are we doing now? Fallacies, informal fallacies. Here we are reasoning. We are trying to give reasons to support a certain claim. When then will you accuse someone of committing a secularity? When the person uses the very claim she's making, claim means that's what you want to say. We ask you why you are saying what you are saying. Then you use the very thing that you are saying to explain or to give reasons why you are saying what you are saying. So you are only repeating yourself. Your claim is what you are using as what the premise, the reason. But therefore, you are going in what circles. You are saying, oh, I say A is true because that's the reason coming, because A is true. That's the pattern. All women are rich because all women are rich. That's the nature. It's in circles. So we go back and come to where we started from. It begs the question. That's the expression because it's, it doesn't have an answer to the question. So it uses the question to answer the question, begging the question. That's why it has that name. And it is also called the tissue principle. So, so example is what you see on the screen. Sir, please read the example. Let me drink some water. The belief in God is universal because everyone believes in God. There we go. The belief in God is universal. Universal means it applies everywhere. Everyone does it. Everyone believes in God. That's what it means, universal. But you tell us the belief in God is universal because when we see because, we are waiting for the reason why. Why is it that everyone believes in God? What makes everyone believe in God? Because we're looking for premise, evidence, reason. They is oh, because everyone believes in God. That's a manipulation of the language. You have to, you have to be smart. Okay? It's secular. The, if you have the textbook, you see that the title of Unit 10 is uh, Polemical Tricks and Rhetorical Ploys. <laughs> It's a ploy, a trap. It's a trick, like a, a, a fraudster. They are trying to play you, so you have to be a critical mind to see through it. And how are they playing through? They are playing through you by the use of language. Sometimes critical thinkers also use that to play on others who are, to outwit them when they are not watching. Okay, so if you are a very smart lawyer, you could be very equivocal. You know you are being equivocal, but it will impress the other person if they are not smart to see through that. You just played on the different connotations of the word freedom or, or the word law and, and got a good judgment. So it goes both ways. You shouldn't be, <laughs> you shouldn't be a trickster. You shouldn't use manipulation. Okay, so there we go with, to the third fallacy, specific fallacy, that that's what that manipulates language. The first broad category is what we are looking at. Pseudo precision. Sir, please read. Pseudo precision, mathematical mystification. That's Using the same That's it's yeah. name. Don't forget. I'm called Nancy Miles. That's my maiden name. Read best my doctorate before I married. Then now, I have the bar for GMP for my husband. It's a very loaded name attached to my miles. So you see that I have a very long name. Why am I saying all this? If you see Nancy Miles on a, a, a publication, it's me. If you see Nancy Bar for GMP on a notice, it's me. If you see Nancy I'm a Miles, it's me. Why am I telling you so that you don't say, oh, doc, the possible answer is no. I, I wrote pseudo precision, but I got it wrong. What about the B? If the B said mathematical mystification, then it could be both. So look at the C. Maybe the C said both. A, pseudo precision. B, mathematical mystification. C, both. D, none. Then you want to choose pseudo precision. You are correct, but I didn't answer the question. So you are wrong for the question. But the answer you choose is correct. Why? Because pseudo precision is also called mathematical mystification. And anything that was a winning one. Eh? Proposition is the same as assertion, is the same as statement. So if you go and choose proposition because you read it, it means you won't know how to argue at parliament if you put you there. Because you are arguing from this direction and the opponent on the other side is arguing from the other direction. You think you are disagreeing, so you are fighting and throwing chairs at each other and embarrassing the whole nation. You don't know how to present a case. <laughs> you can't look at the other perspective. 
So you have to take your turn. That's the training with that, that objective question. You see, look at the options. A, mathematical mystification. Be patient. Kahashi. Kahashi. Oh, hashi chong. Relax and read the next one. What does it also say? Oh, pseudo precision. But mathematical mystification and pseudo precision are the same. In fact, the third one could have been, I am a fallacy that manipulates language. They are all saying the same thing, only saying it differently. So then you know that if you are the one mitigating or mediating that conflict, you will just tell them be patient. Boss, boss Putin, hold on. Boss Zelensky, chill. Hey, Xi Jinping, now we try. You people are all saying one thing. You are all talking sovereignty. Let's see how we negotiate that. Half of the work is done. So you have to learn that skill now at this objective question. Okay, please. People write to you and say, Doc, please, I don't think that my, uh, when they, they release that thing, I saw the question I chose for this one is correct, but they gave me, I said, read the other, did you look at the other options down there? And then some will look and come back and say, oh, didn't see that? I said, mm. so they are all correct. That's why you should choose all of the above. Boss, please read. Using mathematical figures to give an impression of precision or exactness to a term that is already vague. Mm -hmm. Impre impressive. Example. Imprecise. Imprecise. Example. 98.65% mm -hmm. of COVID-19 patients are spiritually motivated. 98% Mo of the patients that got COVID-19 are what? Spiritually motivated. In other words, if you want to interpret it, it looks like a person is saying they got the sickness from a spiritual force. Or you could also say these people have a spiritual motivation. What is spiritual motivation? How do you measure it? The word spiritual, Anala. How do you determine what is spiritual? For you to now come and tell us that after you measured and you did a statistical research and analysis, you have detected that 98, there we go, 0.65%. I am suggesting a certain precision. Precision means exactness, definite. That's what the figures do. So we are all inspired. We are mystified. What dream you so, you know? That's why it's called mathematical mystification. You're using the mathematical figures to give an impression of some exactness and precision. When we go and check what you are trying to be precise about, it's a vague concept, a vague concept. Concepts that are vague do not lend themselves to precision. We know that already. They are open-ended. So it means that concept there cannot be exact. That is why we don't see the point of your introducing some figures there, whatever the analysis is, the concept cannot be directly measured. Eh? Measured to for you to get specificity to it. You have done so, and you have even put maths there. So we tell you, oh, we tell you that you are just using maths to what? Mystify us. You are manipulating the language because the concept there is vague. So you have to revise your vagueness there. Look, if I had said 98.65% of students admitted this year into the University of Ghana, this year, University of Ghana, this year, got a first class. That is measurable. You know the number that came in. You just have to pull the data out. You can tell those who have made a first class by working out their grades, 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 that's all. It is measurable. So you can have a, a precise, figure qualifying the statistics of what of people who got a first class this year it is not it don't constitute a pseudo precision i hope you get that but when you are dealing with a concept that is not measurable directly specifically because what what does it mean for someone to be spiritually motivated for the actions that they are taking? spiritual motivation that they attend church every day or they speak in a big tone or they give more at church these are all not, they are not exactly what it means because someone may not do any of these things and will still consider himself more spiritual. Some don't cut their hair because of that. They think it's a spiritual act. As the Rastafarians. So you the one who has cut your hair. 
you are not spiritual then. They won't eat meat that hasn't been scaled because you are not being spiritual. Some don't even eat fish. They are vegetarians because they are, they are motivated by the spiritual. They feel that the, the fish is also a mother. If they killed your mother and ate in the witchcraft camp, would you like it? So why are we going to take somebody's mother and she's sitting on your food and you are eating it and separating the bones from the flesh? That's how someone, say Hare Krishna, typically devoted Hare Krishna, for example, thinks of you when you put the pork on the stand like that, pork show, and the pork is going around. People are cutting it left, right, center, and eating. That's how the person feels. That's it. He's a spiritual person. So spiritual now, we'll feel it, say it is just you're going to church to go and blow in tongues, which I do. I'm subjecting it to scrutiny for you to see that it's not everybody that defines spirituality that way. So it is a vague concept, having different perspectives. Remember open texture? Here you are claiming you have done your mathematical or statistical search, and you have found that 98.65% of those who have COVID are spiritually motivated. How did you do that measurement of such a vehicle? What are you using to define that? You see that that's a problem. So it's a pseudo precision. It's a fake precision. It's a pretense of a precision. It's a false precision. That's what this means, pseudo precision or mathematical mystification. You are using the mass to bring the inuso. The mass need bring the inuso. If you got that, and you see why these three manipulate language. So first, it was equivocation, you saw secularity, and we have just done pseudo precision, also called mathematical mystification. Now we can move quickly to the next set, which are, which are easier. So I'll just walk you through it. Agro Christian, please continue reading for us. I'll come back to Big Boss if we need to. Thank you very much, sir. I will go ahead. Changing the subject, one. Blind standing. Appeal to the masses or appeal to cons consensus. Instead of giving reasons why we should accept your claim, how very many people believe or embrace that claim. I agree with the example. The footballer played only for themselves and not for the cameras. They didn't no, play and, 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 and for the cameras. And for the cameras, yeah. Yeah, and for the cameras. They didn't play for the team. Ask anyone. Ask anyone. Who they be so bia? Cause mo be mo fam. Ask anyone if what I'm telling you is a lie. You see that? The person says something. We have moved from the fallacies that manipulate language. We have now launched into the the other box inside the big container. Mm -hmm. This other box is labeled those fallacies that change the subject. They divert your attention. They shift your attention from what is being discussed to something else. Take note. So it's a fallacy that changes the subject. And inside that container, there are six fallacies your textbook gives you, which you are studying. The first one is, how does it change our subject? It shifts our attention from the discussion, the issue, to what? The number of people that follow it. So the person is telling you this, Players didn't play for the team. They didn't commit their all in the play. They are just looking at, they want people to catch their attention, cameras. You want to know, ah, but how can you say that? I say, oh, if you think what I'm saying is a lie, you ask anyone. There goes. So he's distracting your attention from the issue. Give us reasons why you say what you are saying. He says, you ask anyone. It's appealing to the masses. What plenty people say. Plenty of people could be wrong. I keep telling people, plenty of people voted for somebody four years ago. I know, let's use the previous year before that, because Donado is still on this. So before Donado, oh, plenty of people say NDC, the big cocker. Before then, <laughs> it was NPP. Four years after, people say, you know, the big cocker. Then they changed. Because what plenty of people say, what a lot of people say may not necessarily be the truth. Plenty of people said crucify him, crucify him, they crucified the savior. 
You see, so we want to be careful when the reasons why we are saying something is just because plenty of people support it. Plenty of people could be wrong, could be wrong. Now, it is better for you to look at what the plenty of people are following and then make that your reason for arguing for the point. Okay, so plenty of people are following it, Yate. I would look at why the are, are plenty of people are following that, that view. So plenty of people say, oh, wait, somebody's background is better. Is it, I will, I will keep it muted until you have to speak again. It's not too, the feedback is a bit uh, offensive. Now, Adam, please put my pony on my forehead. That's my example I give. Please put the pony on my forehead. That's the wedding girl telling the beautician. So the beautician, I'll do it for you. But why do you want us to put the pony on your forehead? Then she said, oh, but that is what everybody's doing now. I mean, that's what is invoke now. Invoke everybody. Really? Look at the size of your forehead. See that? That's the problem. If you follow everybody, that's the mistake you make. Oh, I, I don't, I don't want, I don't want it this way. You know, I'm a Legon girl, and we every Legon girl does. There you go, appealing to what the masses say. So we we think that that is fallacious. Obia CIS syndrome doesn't work. Give reasons. This is a distraction from the reasons, and we'll call it what appealing to the masses. It changes the subject. The same with what you see on your screen now. Look at it. Ad hominem. Meaning what? Attacking the person. The, the Latin expression for argument for appealing to the masses is what? Argumentum ad populum. From the word popular, popular stand, grand stand, eh? where plenty of people are. Argument of popularity. Argumentum ad populum. Popular. Okay, so argumentum ad populum. You see that in the text. This one is the fallacy that attacks the person. It's called argumentum ad hominem, argument of the person, homo sapiens, homo, eh, hominem, argument of the person. You leave the issue being discussed and you focus now on the person and his or her circumstances. The father, you know, she was born, or the, her skin color or her height. <laughs> when we are talking about a policy decision that a person is presented, you agree or disagree? Why? Give us reasons. There you go, talking about the person's hometown that he or she comes from and the height they have and, and, and stuff like that. We say you are committing ad hominem. It could be eulogistic, look on your screen, to eulogize someone, praise the person. Eulogy. Hmm? During a funeral service, you see that they, they come and eulogize the person. Hey, when people die, they are angels. Oh, the way this brother was a good man. Yeah, more. Human beings, especially we Christians. Yeah, hypocrite. But God will have mercy on all hypocrites like myself and you. Okay. <laughs> we eulogize. Remember, I said that when we're discussing at hominem, eulogizing. So you leave the issue and you start talking about pleasant and positive laudatory laudatory to loud someone eh, to, to say good things about the person, laudatory stuff about the person, just to make us accept the view. Oh, I think we should listen to what eh, Dr. Miles is saying. <laughs> Why? Oh, because, you know, that woman is very, look at what we're discussing. Let's say we're at the lecture hall. The fan is on. That's what I put in the recording. I like to repeat the example so you can connect to them. Okay. So we are the lecture hall. I'm your classmate. We are all seated. We are listening to the lecture. Then the fan, kuchu, 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 is just going around and making noise a little. Okay. Then, then Nancy gets up and says, Oh, I think that, look, dog, please hold on. I think we should switch off the fan and put on the AC instead because I can't hear you. And the lecture is, too is the last lecture. We want to make sure you get everything. Then let me see who said, uh -huh. Christian Agbo says, <laughs> No, I don't think we should listen to what Nancy says. So the class wants to know why. There we go. You see, we are discussing the fan and AC and trying to hear a lecture. If Christian Agbo thinks otherwise, maybe he will say, oh, I don't think we should switch off the fan because the AC doesn't work well. 
Maybe when if Nancy moves from her seat and sits at the extreme end over there, she will be here, Doc Clara, and we can still have a circulation, a ventilation. You see, the, the air must move around because COVID is on and all that. So that's why I think we should keep the pan on. Nancy can move to the other side. If he said that, it means we are now going to engage and deliberate and see who is making a more reasonable you know, grounds and stuff we are, we will discuss. It's still about the issue, even if we have a disagreement. Now, suppose Christian got up and said, don't, I don't think we should listen to what Nancy is saying. Why? He said, oh, the people call Nancy, sometimes you don't know what, they, they think that because she bears the same name like the lecture. Why? Every time when we come for lecture, she wants to talk, she wants to be seen because her father has money or something like that. And because yesterday she was first in class. They should let us also talk some when we come to Obra, Obra, Oba, at one pound, aid one, can't say no, be there. They didn't talk about the issue. You left the issue at discussing the person ad hominem this logistic. Now, suppose in reaction to Christian Agu, whose name is there? I see Esther Mensa. So Esther Ankuma Mensa puts up her hand and says, no, Doc, I, I disagree with Christian Abu on this one. So there comes Esther coming to react to the same issue. Then she says, because I think that Nancy, Nancy's view must be accepted. You know, that lady really cares for people. <laughs> Even this morning, I didn't have a pen for my exam. She gave me a pen. She's always trying to make sure that the special students in the class come in and get a good place to sit. <laughs> She's my neighbor. I even attend church with her. She has never been found engaging with anybody over. Oh, sister, all these things you are saying are nice. We are all happy that we have such a person as a class. But we are talking about the fun. Hello, fun and air condition. Hello. Not all these nice things you are saying about Nancy. So we are happy that you say all but it is still ad hominem. But this one is not this logistic, it's eulogistic. And so you will see the example where someone said, example two on your screen now, he cannot be president because he's too short. Very, very, very unfortunate by happened in our country here. That is what attacking the person is. Is it eulogistic or dislogistic? I want a chorus answer, then we continue. This logistic. I know it's logistic, but is it eulo or this? <laughs> because people it's waited. Eulogistic. When you say, is it this or eulo? Just say that way. I want to say, ah. This. 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 Very this. Good. Yeah. That's all I want to hear. So it's a this logistic, it's negative. That's why when we ask you to create an example of an ad hominem, this logistic fallacy, you should be able to create one easily. You don't waste all your time writing a long essay. Think. Let the understanding of the fallacy roll in your mind and put yourself in the shoes of someone who is helping another person understand that fallacy. Like I'm trying to do with all the various examples and, and things. That's how so you are learning how to construct, create, assess, evaluate, judge. That is the skill we are developing. It's a critical thinking skill. So when you go now to the management position in that bank, you can creatively <laughs> bring issues out. You have that skill, which you learned first creating for ad hominem this logistic. Then the same with ad hominem geologistic. Look at the person. I think we should listen to what Kofi says about the product because Kofi is handsome. He comes from my hometown. He really speaks good English too. Ukrasi me. If you love Kofi, go and tell him. But this one has not. <laughs> so ad hominem geologistic. You got that. So that's the second fallacy that that's what changes the subject. What was the first one? Excuse me. The first one was this grandstanding, appealing to the masses, argumentum ad populum. What was the second one? Attacking the person, whether you logistic or dislogistic. It is what? Uh, it's, the Latin is what? Argumentum ad hominem. Then the third one, appeal to illegitimate authority. Uh, my colleague says unqualified authority. Yes. The person is an expert, an authority in the field he is an authority in. 
but the issue we are discussing is not where he is an authority in. So he is a boss, he's a boss, he's an expert in some discipline, say accounts or maths or something like that. But we are not discussing that. So if you go and appeal to him or her to ground the claim in another discipline, another area of expertise, we will accuse you of appealing to the wrong authority. Why wrong? Because it's not qualified to be the authority in the field we are discussing. That's all. That's the problem. Say, so read HIV causes AIDS. HIV causes AIDS. It must be. So, since George W. Bush said it, and he is the president of the most powerful military force in the world. Mm -hmm. and here. The person knows that we all respect or we all fear, or not fear, we all value, we cherish that authority. He is the boss of a powerful military, military state. Therefore, if he makes a statement about HIV, which is health, we should, we should listen. No, 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 says the critical thinker. No, sir. His authority is in a certain discipline. That's why we go and get a celebrity, an actor, say, or a comedian or something. To, and then you say, because that comedian says so and so and so, a footballer says something, therefore the thing is good. And people are gullible, so the advertisers use that. Some shoddy, quote and unquote, useless product. No apologies. But someone doesn't care about their brand. They get it and then they use their hard end brand to sell the product for them. You go and buy it. You are you are so sad. Ah. So you, if you're a critical man, you don't want them to play on you like that. What is the point? If it is the person speaking is an authority in the field in question, we will manage it like that. Even that one we criticize sometimes. How much more the person not being an authority in the field? Okay, then the person is the one ground. That is the one we call illegitimate appeal to authority. It's a distraction. They drag, they drag your attention. They divert your attention from the issue to what? The personality, the authority of another field and use that to attract your attention, to come and support the thing. If you are smart, then you too, you will ignore them. The next one. So I read the whole thing on the screen. Fallacies that change the subject for appeal to pity, emotions, vanity. Invoking pity instead of giving reasons why a claim should be accepted. Example. Very good. Mm. Go ahead. A young boy to the judge said, sorry. A young boy to the judge after killing both of his parents. Please have mercy on me because I am an orphan. The person is invoking pity in the judge. You have gone to kill both of your parents. Whatever happens, we don't know. Now you are using that as a plea. Please have mercy on me because I'm an orphan. Who made you an orphan? It's an <laughs> it's appeal to pity. My sister, why do you think you qualify for this job? Remember the examples I gave you, lecture one. This is a sister at an interview panel. She's being interviewed to be given a job in marketing. Why do you think you qualify for this job? Why should we give you a job? So, <laughs> because I've suffered. Please, I've suffered in this my life. No, no, be so. What is this? Be embarrassed by it. Don't do that. I've suffered even the queue. If you look at the people in the queue, you see that this job, they don't let women do it. I'm the only woman in the queue. <laughs> and even as I was coming, I didn't eat. I didn't have transport. I really had to suffer. I need a job. Otherwise, hey, my sister, Jai, I am. Stop it. It's appeal to pity. Emotions. Run it. Argumentum ad misericordia. Misery. From the word misericordia. Why do you want to do that? Don't do that. It is invoking people. Look, people can come to you. I said, sometimes it's funny. Please, 
you have to change this grade for me. Why? Did I undermark you or overmark you? Okay. Do, do, do you think you qualified for so was there a legitimate reason? You you appeal to reason, you see, give reasons so that people can now think through and say, what how else can we work about you? The person comes. If you don't change this my D to an A, look, my mother will commit suicide and die on you. <laughs> I have really gone through so much. Hey, yeah, now it's now away. Remember, Hanky, I'll give you Hanky, we'll cry together. I even give you transport if I have it. But Charlie, the grade will not change. Because when we do that, what we are doing eh, is we are making someone who put in an effort, someone came to school, brother. After school, hard learning, you go and sell in the traffic. Daytime, in the evening, you go and do the pump, fuel pump for some small coins, ala ala. At night, he will watch, he will be a bouncer at a club. So that you get 200 here, 50 here, 10 Ghana, you sell meat by daytime. He's also learning like you. Sometimes he has to go and do it at a faraway place because students will see him. Then you get all and gather. Then you sleep three hours, you wake up at night and learn the slides. Yes, <laughs> give me the, give me what I'll eat. What you eat, they sell bread. Go to the people who sell bread, tell them, give me bread. I'll sell it. Come and give you your money and then the commission on it, I'll eat. Those of you, uh, those of us teaching you have gone through that. We didn't go and follow someone's husband. Stop appealing to pity. Tell the panel, so back to the one I was giving, tell the panel that look, this marketing, I think that I'm the best candidate on the team of panelists, uh, excuse me, on, on, on the team of interviewees that you have. Who can do this job? Give me, see what I have to speak, look at the tone, look at the posture. Give me this job for three months and see how I tend to work. Because it's a, it's, an, it's a competition, you're competing for the role. You've had a very bad, perhaps a difficult life. Turn it to a positivity. So I am able to, to, to be a, a best marketer for this company because I've had life difficulties that have exposed me to people and places that I'm able to understand personalities and present products to them to meet their needs. They will buy when I sell it. I've sold sugar cane. I've had to be the only person taking care of myself. So you are saying the same things, you know, yeah? but you are not using it to invoke pity. I think that if you don't give me this job, I'll be hungry. I've suffered all my life. So this is the only opportunity I have to, because this is the only opportunity, we shouldn't be concerned about the profit we have set up for. You think the person went to collect the money from the ground? <laughs> it's a loan, he has to pay. So the company has a target. That is why you should, you should stop invoking, uh, invoking your pity. Give reasons. Oh, that is all. I think you got that. Then the next one is also like this one. It is diversionary. But the diversion is a threat, implicit or explicit. Sometimes direct threat, sometimes hidden threat. Kofi is telling Kwame his playmate. I have to ride your bicycle the whole of today. Because if not, then your mother will hear that you beat your sister yesterday. Rich, you went to the market. So the ball is in your court. You see what is happening? <laughs> A guy will ride the bike the whole day. Brother has no seat. Because, and that's what happens with those who, um, what's the name of that expression? Kidnappers or someone who wants to blackmail. Yeah. They appeal to threat. The person won't give you reasons why. Kofi, you have to marry me. You can do this to me. You have to marry me. You would think it's appeal to pity. Listen to what she says. Well, if you don't marry me, then I'm not able to tell my father to give you a job in, a, in this very rich company. Oh, if you don't marry me, you're not getting the job. That's appeal to threat to that poor lady who has come with her application. She has the qualification, she has the competence, she's very confident, decent, has applied for the job. Then you, Mr. Tomatman, you say, well, I think I'll give you the job if, and what is the reason? You will get the job. 
if you open your something, your legs apart. Why? You threaten people. You appeal mm. to the consequences. Mm. And yet, sometimes not only bosses, so some females also do that. It's not men bosses. Female bosses also do that. Just that they might not be explicit because of the cultural setting. But they may be, they will be. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. They could be erotic in the way they are behaving. Oh, but you are fine, brother, like that, and you don't have a job. Think through it very well. Eh? If you want to be my personal PA, dear, my PA, dear, we will think about it. But all the ones that you have applied for, dear, eh? I'm sorry, we don't have a, a place for such well built six pack guys like you. Look, look at what she's doing. Look at, look at the demeanor. <laughs> it is appeal to consequence, it's false, it's implicit. So I'd like to give the explicit ones. Then now, when you are applying it or you are interrogating a matter or there is a sexual harassment issue before you as a committee, you have become a big man somewhere, big woman somewhere. We pray that for you. But when you get to the grounds, you will do stuff. You have to apply critical thinking. Don't be in a hurry to say it's a man and a woman issue. So it, it means that it is the man that has harassed the woman. Sometimes the woman that has harassed the man and the man doesn't have control. Then he has poured it, and then there's trouble. Okay, so you have to be a critical mind. Please read Appeal to Threats. That's the fifth one. Changes the subject, focuses on the threat. Appeal to Threats. Threats or fear or consequences. Instead of giving reasons, you appeal to consequences or what will happen if the listener does not believe or accept what you believe. Very good. Example. Example. You should support our SRC president on this demonstration. Otherwise, people will take you for a coward. You would have no friends, and after school, you will struggle with getting a job. <laughs> you see how it seems as if the person is giving you reasons. There are no reasons. They are threatening you. You have to support the man on this demonstration. Else, you won't get a job. <laughs> after school, you won't get a job because we have you will be classmates. It's we know we will be in positions. Everybody say you are not a brother. Ah. So as for the reason why the demonstration is going on, we shouldn't interrogate it as minds, eh? critical thinkers. We shouldn't think. Oh, Muhai, you are disturbing us in Ghana. <laughs> the way people are gullible. And, and you know that daily bread matters is an issue. So if this is a person under threat. The sister must eat. So sometimes they are thinking about the issue but they know that if they let reason lead, they'll be hungry. Help us, eh? Sometimes the person is thinking about the, the decision to either give the grade or not give the grade, but they are worried. The guy, the way the guy is speaking my scholarship, I'm losing it. And this look at plenty emotions. Ante judge, you are a woman like me, oh. you are a woman like me. Meanwhile, you've gone to rob someone or you're going to pour acid on someone's daughter and deform the woman because you felt she was ch chasing your a uh, recalcitrant chachiko boyfriend you are going to pour acid on someone's daughter and she's deformed you have been caught and you're in the witness stand or whatever being interrogated they ask you did you do that or not then you turn to the judge who will make the decision ultimately and who is a female and the judge i'm a woman like you or you were a woman like me. I have children. My auntie, stop the diversion and answer the question. It's not wickedness. It is what? Fairness. So these fallacies are what? Changing the subject. They are distracting you. When you were pouring the acid on the girl, did you think she was a tree? She's somebody's daughter. A woman like you. So stop doing you were a woman like me. And I have four children. Or who take care of my children? And all those things she has said. They are diversionary. Let's focus on, did you pour the acid or not? If you like, tell us, I poured it. I acted irrationally. That is pleading guilty. That's why some people plead guilty. They get a lesser term. They will be punished then they will buy it as less because the person has come to terms. But some people don't want to accept it. Until they want to rationalize what they did. If you're a woman, they come and tell you that this, and you go and see this, what will you do? What will you do? I'll close my eyes and sleep if I come back. You didn't close your eyes. Where I saw that alarm. Years on, being lied to in the face like that, a brother who is international like that at the time, still 
spot on. Look at him even at his age. Then if what we have heard in the news is in the news, right, we can talk about it. Eh? No offenses. Living with a woman, that's what we heard. Having supposed children that apparently weren't his. Hey, the day you wake up to this one, it can make you crazy. If he wants to rationalize it, do you think that my, my sister, who is the wife there, will be alive and the children? By now, they should be obituary because it hurts. But you have to let reason lead. So if people are diverting that they're either appealing to masses or consequences, and you know that my mother and father have been fighting over my education, it's just my mother that has been doing this thing, I go and tell them that I got an F. She will commit suicide. She will die on you. Hey. So what? Conclusion. So change the grade. <laughs> change it from A, a, a D to A. Hey, is that your reason? And maybe the whole family will go suicide and go for bed. We will cry with them by lie. It doesn't work that way. You will hurt other people by that kind of principle if we did it. Okay. But we can be very humane and look at the reasons as okay. Then if that is the case, we open or oh, oh, let's write to academic affairs and ask for an exemption. That's how come there are exemptions all the time. Sanctioned ones that have looked at all the aspects. Because the people brought what? Reason. The person is slow to hear it, or the person cannot see. Okay, visually impaired. And in the past, they didn't have any exception to the rule. If it's one hour, one hour for everybody. Now it's not so. The person has a, an impairment, cannot type, doesn't have fingers. Apologies. You have given essay type. Like, when will he finish type? If you gave him the whole day graph, he's now going to punch with his fist. So when the argumentation comes, it's better than that. You know that we, the people are blind. What is this? It's invoking people. No. Present argument. There's a thin line between the two. So what one person can do by just typing, prepare, 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 even if it's nonsense, can type or write down. What about if the person doesn't have a fist? Uh, excuse me, doesn't have fingers. So you see, we are reasoning. Oh, okay. Then maybe we give an extra time. They shouldn't write an exam. No, but that will not be fair. Then everybody will say, I'm not sick. They just have to connive with her. I'm not well. They just have to connive with her medical doctor or someone she, and bring the report. And then everybody coming to the university will not write an exam. What would that be? Okay, then we think, so we have we reason about it. And then it's okay. Then give half the time or sometimes give double the time. Or some people don't give them mathematical uh, symbols. So elements of formal logic like this. It's a course I teach in philosophy. They are diagrams like mathematics. Perhaps even a bit tougher, quote unquote, than math. You see that? When I say tougher, because we are just not dealing with concept, there are also symbols and then arrangements and interpretation of the concept and stuff like that. So if you have a special student doing that, then the policy is you don't give them because you cannot see sh shapes. You can't see the conditional sign, like addition, plus or minus or square root of this issue. How do you arrive at those? policy decisions. You reason. You don't invoke pity. If you do invocation of pity, you say, when you say, when they don't come to me. Would that help them? No. Okay, so no invocation of pity. Don't do that. See how long I've spent, how much time I've spent on that. We are ending the course. It must make an impact in your life. You use the unfortunate things in your life positively. Capture the strength of it and then present that in an argumentation form. Present the main lines of argumentation, the reasons, not threat, not masses, not pity, etc. Then the one on your screen, which you saw when we did causal reasoning, it's what genetic fallacy, because of the source, the antecedent, the genesis of it, where it began, who gave uh, the thing, what gave rise to it. See, So you say we should accept it or because of its genesis, its antecedent, its, its uh, genesis, its uh, cause. I'm using the video, its origin, so you say we should accept it. Either way, it will be genetic fallacy. Remember, we said the product is, is from China, so it is not good. When you reason that way, you have a problem. You are just dealing with what genesis. It could be from China and could be very good. It could be from America and could be very bad. So the source in itself doesn't make it good or bad. You see, if someone says, oh, but doc, most of the time, but that's not what the person is saying. 
the person just rejects it outright because it's that's the source. When I say we the assimilation alone, don't try isn't it this assimilation man that what what good can come from Nazareth? That's what the people said. But the man was from Nazareth, but he was the savior of the world, born in a manger, but he saved the world. At least pay my feet. You can have yours. Don't worry. You see the point. So when you discredit or accept just because of the source, you are committing what is it? This one, genetic fallacy. No questions about it. Then we move to the last three sets. The, the, the last three fallacies in the set called what? The fallacies that manipulate the data. We did fallacies that manipulate language earlier. We are doing the, 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 the middle set with fallacies that change the subject. And these ones are the fallacies that manipulate the evidence, the data, the observation statement, the premises, the, uh, the reasons. So fallacies that are manipulating that data given to you, the evidence given to you. And that's what his one is hasty generalization. Please read it, uh, Christian. After Christian, we can take Tina now. I see Tina's hand. And Tina will do the last one. Go ahead, Christian. Fallacies that result from manipulating of data. Hasty generalization. Insufficient mm. evidence. Drawing mm. a general conclusion from a sample that is considered insufficient. Mm -hmm. Example. All the three guys that have been with were cheats. So guys are cheats. So I did. Remember the other one? Remember the other one? The other chat was. Men are not reliable. That's all I said in cheat. Okay. Women are cheats. Politicians are corrupt. Uh, lecturers are what? Man, be wicked. Now look. These are all general claims. You said this, that guys are cheat. We ask you, what is your evidence? What is your ground? What data supports what you are saying? What is the reason for saying that? You see how many time, ways I've said the same thing? What's your reason for saying guys are cheat? You say, oh, but I've been with Achu. He was a guy, he cheated. Hey, I go Christian. He himself, he was my tattoo. He cheated me. Which other name? I'm like Kwabla. <laughs> Kwabla, you are, I've made you one, don't worry. Kwabla too. I'm seeing names on my screen. They are the ones I'm using. Kwabla too. Guy cheated. Yesterday, Abdul Ghani too cheated. He cheated me. So see the examples I've given you. So as for guys, they are cheated. That is hasty generalization. You are using the insufficient evidence to draw a general conclusion. That's all. That's the problem we have with the way you are reasoning. Because all the examples you have given may be true. But it doesn't mean, therefore, that guys are cheat. Because guys are cheat means guys of all times, all places, born already, dead and gone, yet to be born. I'm speaking about them. What's your evidence for saying that? You say you have been with three guys. Hey, and there you are. How many have you met? Oh, as for girls, they are like this. Oh, pantophones, they are. Oh, you know, the northerners, they are like this. Oh, politicians are this. Christians are hypocrites. I just said some. If you ask me why I say that and I gave you some examples, that is where the problem is. Because you haven't met many. Men are not reliable. You, when were you born? How many men have you met? met? Did you meet boys or men? <laughs> So what? So it is insufficient evidence. You need to, you should be able to create one, identify one, assess one, evaluate one, judge one, etc. The same thing is happening with misplaced vividness. It is also a fallacy of insufficient evidence. If you look on my slide, you see that. Like hasty generalization. That's why we say it manipulates the data. However, Apart from it being insufficient and evident, so maybe you have just one instance of something and you are drawing a conclusion about a whole. Apart from that problem, there is also a certain emotional or if you like provocative connection, sense, something sensational about that experience you had based on which you are drawing that overly generalized conclusion. That is the only, so I told your friends, let me tell you also. If you, if you were in the first class, you see that I've repeated everything. Uh -huh. That's how I teach. So there's no point being in all, all the time. Now, suppose you're in a, a relationship, a marriage or something. Hmm? 
It didn't go well. Have it gone bad? Brother beats you, chops your money, chops your food, chops your <clears throat> everything, everything chops, beats you mercilessly, messes you up. You are so stressed that so you leave that marriage. You, you, you divorced. Now you say there's an issue about a certain relationship. Then you say that is to me, this is the reason why I say marriage is not it's not important. Divorce is the thing. Everybody who is in the marriage is in chains. You better go get divorced. See the conclusion. Everybody married should go and get divorced. What is your reason? I tell you, I was in a marriage situation. Eh? The way the guy beat me, chopped my money, chopped my food, chopped my peace, chopped my this, you know? <laughs> and he kept messing my life up until I left him. When I left him, look at me. I'm okay now. As an unmarried divorcee. Is there a, a married divorcee? <laughs> yeah, possibly. So I'm, I'm married and my life is okay. So what is the conclusion you are drawing? Hello, excuse me. The conclusion is so divorce is the thing to do. Go get divorced, every married person. Hey, auntie. Sorry if you have gone through any such situation. But don't let that one or two or three emotional impacts that you had about a certain scenario, whether positive emotions or negative emotions. Don't make that be the grounds on which you are drawing such an overgeneralized conclusion, which is almost irrelevant. Because there are people who are also having a blissful marriage. It was only one marriage that they entered into. That has changed their lives positively, their families, their spiritual life. They have beautiful children now. The whole home is blessed materially and spiritually, because of one person's marriage with another person. So if you have gone and it wasn't pleasant, and we don't wish that for anyone, myself or anyone else, it's not pleasant, but don't over generalize to draw a conclusion because of that experience you had. That's the problem with uh, this type of fallacy we call misplaced vividness. It is like, uh, what's the thing? It's like hasty generalization. But this one is not only generalizing in a haste, the vividness, the emphasis is misplaced. You are emphasizing something else. Why divorce is the way to go? Because of your instance of a failed marriage. Who says so? The emphasis is me. Tell people that when you are entering marriage, for example, open your eyes before. Because others are having a successful home. So the, the emphasis should be on something else, not where you are diverting it because of the impact you had. This, the evidence is not sufficient and the emphasis or vividness is misplaced. If you got that, then the very last one, which is the fallacy that manipulates data, number three. So what are those fallacies that manipulate the evidence? Hasty generalization and the brother called misplaced vividness. And here we are on the third one. It is still a fallacy that is manipulating data. But which type is that? The semi-attached figures. And that is a little bit technical. I, I, I've tried recently to make it clearer for students. See, you have an evidence or a premise or a reasons, a data. That is true. We don't want to contend with the data. But it doesn't connect to the conclusion you are drawing. So, <laughs> even if we granted the premise to be true, the conclusion is not a consequence of it. It doesn't follow from it. So you are using figures there too. Mathematics is at play again. That's why it is called semi-attached figures. There are figures attached. But the figures attached to the premise do not fully mm, connect to the conclusion. So it's a semi-attached, a partially attached evidence, mathematical evidence, statistical evidence. Okay. Why is that so? Because the premise could be true. It doesn't lead to the conclusion. I think these examples will help. I use that for the other group. So let me use this. As we get feedback from you, it helps us improve it to make the examples more explicit and straightforward. So look at uh, two. I've done a research. Then it turns out that you are city campus. So let me make you feel good. We did the findings. We found that those who did critical thinking, let's say for city campus this semester, 70% of city campus tests who did critical thinking got a first class. Let's, let's say that 
70% city campus. What did they get? First class, in which cost critical thinking. Take note, that's what the evidence says. If we compare it to main campus, maybe it wasn't 70% that had the first class, it was 80%. No, no, we want you to feel good and just make 60%. 60% of main campus people got a first class. In which mm. class? Brand new. <laughs> okay, mm. so 60% main campus, 70% city campus. In which cause critical thinking? That's the evidence. What am I trying to show you? Semi attached figures. Look at the screen. It's figures, yes. But the, is this pseudo precision? Not exactly so. Look at it. They can overlap, but it's not the same. Okay. Your textbook even gave an example that said in that example, they are both committing semi attached figures and pseudo precision at the same time. So when do you call it pseudo precision? We saw that earlier. The concept is not clear. So if you go and attach figures there, it will be a fake precision you are trying to present. That is what we saw earlier, okay? This, the concept is vague, that's why. But here, it's not really about a vague concept. It is just that even if we accepted those uh, statistics as true in your premises, okay? It doesn't lead us to the conclusion. So here, I'm, I'm showing you that 60% main campus got a first class in, in critical thinking. Do we say a first class in critical thinking? No, they got a 70% pass in critical thinking. Then these other people got a higher percentage. The city campus folk got a higher percentage. In critical thinking, then comes the conclusion. The person concludes that therefore, city campus students are more intelligent than main campus students. Oh, and there you are. Is that how you think? What kind of analysis is that? But your research was on only critical thinking, for example. And the statistics are true of what? Critical thinking, when you compare city campus to what main campus student for that year. So the statistics is true. The premises you have offered is true. But you are using that to draw a conclusion about something that is not critical thinking matter. See the point? So true premises having statistics, figures, but false conclusion or false implication false consequence. That is what makes it a semi-attached figure. The figures are attached. It's talking about learning, yes. It's talking about uh, uh, city campus versus main campus, yes. But the conclusion you are drawing is not, is the figures don't fully attach to that conclusion. It's partial, it's halfway through. I'm talking critical thinking. Meanwhile, the conclusion is about they are being intelligent. But people can be good in only critical thinking. And when you check all the others, they might not be too good. So how do you draw this general, or if you like, way of conclusion when your evidence, the statistical evidence you have, it's a statistical thing, that's why it's figures. The evidence you have is pointing at something else. You are drawing conclusion on something else. What you are pointing to could be true. The conclusion you are drawing is not true. Is false. So when you search online, you see it tells you that semi attached figures is committed when you have true premises leading to a false conclusion. And then we are being advised on something. Let me get Tina to read. Tina, are you there? Or you just put your hand up. If you are there, then read the last slide. If not, yes, please go ahead. Note. Listen to Tina. One can be wrong to this point is to go as if they are wrong as but that's a three is long. So, I've been up in the district. Thank you very much, Tina. I would, I would ask someone else to read again because I think we didn't hear Tina too clearly. So, if you have a very good background, uh, Kumi, Kumi, your hand shut up quickly. Do you want to read? We had our time is up, so let's hurry up. I have to take a break before I, I faint. <laughs> oh, okay, four hands. Yay. Okay, let me take um Krista Belly Silfi. Yeah. Uh -huh. One passage may commit more than one fallacy. Very good. One fallacy may belong to the different categories. 
the good. point is to know the fallacy itself, not necessarily which category it belongs to. Very good. More examples are available in the test book. Study them. This is coming from your your mate, not me. She says, if you go into the <laughs> Bible, no, in some woman, hey, I'm with you. <laughs> I friend, we say, hey, yeah. if it wasn't for this teaching service that I came to, I wouldn't know that the Bible that this is said, oh, I'm going to tell my pastor, I said, Bible, in some way, the Lord bless you, the Lord. Bible, in some way, you are telling your friend, there are things in the text. This is coming from Christabel, not me. She says, there are stuff in the test book. Look inside. <laughs> so there are examples there to help you understand it. More of them. There is a reason why you have you need more of the example. What they do is they give you understanding. They are illustrated. Then you have also been told that don't think that because someone saw this fallacy and all they can see wrong with it is that it is appealing to the masses. You could also look at that same fallacy and see that even though it's appealing to the masses, it's also committing genetic fallacy or even ad hominem as well for different reasons. So one person sitting in front of the physician, the doctor, he came with headache as his problem, but people can see that he has constipation issue too, and he has lost appetite. They are all different sicknesses for different reasons. He even has worms issue as well. One fallacy like this, one passage standing there like this, could be committing more than one error. It doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. Then the second point that Christabel says we should take note of is what? That one fallacy, one passage like this standing there, may belong to two different, or even sometimes three or four categories, groupings, categories, okay? It could be a fallacy that is that passage standing there could be manipulating data. So maybe it's a pseudo, a, a, a semi-attached figure, so it's manipulating the data, and yet it is also committing pseudo precision because it is the the statistics are not fully, the, uh, they are not a uh, qualifying uh, a measurable concept. You see, so the the figure is dealing with what a vague concept that would be pseudo precision, and perhaps even after that is done, the figures don't fully attach. In other words, the premises would not do what support the conclusion. The premises will be saying something that is true, and yet the conclusion is drawing its way off. See, so semi-attached figure, pseudo precision, and maybe at the same time, it's appealing to the masses. So one fallacy could be manipulating data, manipulating language, changing the subject. Why are we telling you that? So that you don't have a straight jacketed posture when you are studying or you are listening to people, when you are engaging people in everyday life. The person may be committing more than one fallacy. For your exam preparation you see on your screen, you know all these already. But maybe for pe people like to hear it from their colleagues than sometimes hearing it from you. So someone else read, we've heard what Krista Bell said. Someone else read the last thing on the slide and then I can end. Tap your hand, please, if you want to do the reading. Thank you, Anita Akutia. Your hand was up earlier. You don't give up. Well done. Please read what is on the screen. Exam preparation. Yeah. Units for exam. Six, listen, seven, to, nine. listen to Madam Akutia. I mean, if any person in you. <laughs> listen to her. Anita, you. Anita is talking to you, Muti. And you go ahead, please. Units for exam. Six, seven, nine, and ten. Fifty percent. Good. 30 lecture resources, that is slides, videos, question and answer sessions, etc. Posted to resources, along with a prescribed test book. See how I've italicized it, along with the prescribed test book. What's my slant? It means it's for emphasis. Do that as guided by the test book. That will help you not to learn everything that is passing in the skies. No. A textbook is your guide. So we work within that frame. And every examiner, especially if you are doing a university-wide course that comes with a prescribed textbook, it means you could have read around, read plenty of things on the course called critical thinking. I mean, it's, it's the toast of the generation. Everyone does it. Bankers are doing it, military folks, this. We are lawyers. We are, we are engaging people everywhere. So critical thinking is key. But because of that, we give you a focus within which work. Otherwise, you will know so much and won't be able to answer this prescribed test.
test book, not some test book that looks nice on a shelf. Okay, first into uh, point two and two. Study other groups' resources on these units for enrichment. Since the whole teaching theme, team will examine you for the final exam. That's important. Then the third one. Practice exercises in the textbook yourself, a tutorial and among yourselves. So one kasa who you thank you all the best in the basis here. So sister is learning on her own, then she will get two or three others like her, they, they sit under the tree over banana and granite. And be saying, hey, so the mode is ponensible. Which one is the antecedent? Because I saw this. There's someone who oh, okay, empirical content is this, this. And I think the fallacy for this is that, okay, cause that reason, JS knows that you do that. I'm telling you, it's very effective. People don't know. See how I teach. When I'm teaching, I don't, I, I'm not technical as well. At a certain level, if you're engaging PhDs or MPhils, or even level 400, so sometimes even 300, and the nature of the content, we don't waste time. I would have, this one I would have completed in 20 minutes. But it is because of how, so that people will do, I want you to do, and adopt that skill for your other courses, chat, chat about the content. Don't be too formal about content. Because concern you didn't seven years ago, you can remember. Well, seven years ago, gossip, sisters, under the tree, how we clapped them. Meaning now we can remember, we don't forget, we don't need to be reminded. But the thing you read at the library yesterday, there, with your specs on, with the room quiet and sitting there and doing all this serious thing, I've forgotten. It is the setting. Sometimes the setting is part of it. So engage colleagues, sit under the trees. Maybe you're driving home and they're throttle. Okay, so the modus ponens generally. No, no, no. That ponens is the one that affirms that this is the consequence. It will stick. Then you do well. Get A and go. When you see me in town, call me, hey, then we laugh. Hi, hi, hi. That's all. I'm at peace. Why? So engage the content yourself, but do it with some other person in your room there or in your study group or whatever. And then among yourselves, a tutorial, and you will do excellently well. I wish you all the best, all the best in your preparations. Any questions? Thank you, um, Lydia Anita. Any yeah. questions? Yeah, all the best.